Hello, and welcome to the Everyday Business Problems Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Chrysler. Each episode, we talk to business owners and leaders to learn about their story, their business, the challenges they've overcome, and the challenges they still face. You'll hear fresh insights, real talk, and get inspiration to grow your business. Hey, everybody. So excited today to welcome Greg Barber to the podcast. Greg founded Eco-Friendly Printer and is doing some really amazing work around sustainability in the print manufacturing space. Greg, I am so excited to welcome you to the Everyday Business Problems Podcast. And I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, thanks Uh, again. uh, So just to jump right into this, I really would love you to give us a definition of what you mean by eco-friendly printer. I know it's your company name, but it's really so much bigger than that. And what I found in my time in print is a lot of people talk about sustainability and recycling, and but it's more from a marketing standpoint. And um, what you're doing, I think, is just so much greater than that. So can you kind of walk us through what you really mean uh, and what your stance really is around the sustainability? Well, people always ask me, what is an environmental printer? And I say to him, to anybody that asks me that question, that an environmental printer, we print, or I print on 100% recycled paper. Uh, and you could print, print on 30% post-consumer waste paper, which is the minimum specs for the government, but I chose to go to 100% recycled paper. Um, I use soy-based or, or 100% non-toxic toner. Um, soy base is for large offset jobs, and the uh, toner is for small digital jobs. Uh, people ask me, well, is soy ink more environmental than the toner? And I go, well, the toner is 100% non-toxic, and the soy inks are only 14% non-toxic. A lot of people think soy based inks are 100% non-toxic, but it's only 14%. And as if you want 100% soy, you got to go to your Chinese restaurant. That's just a little little joke, but <laughs> and uh, uh, also an environmental printer. Uh, make sure that you don't waste paper. You don't have excess paper going to the landfill. And how do you do that? You, I tell people, if you're going to decide do a brochure, try to stay within the standard sizes of the paper mills. And let's say eight and a half, eleven is a typical size. Uh, 1117, double that up to almost 2335, come back in half and go to five and a half, eight and a half. So therefore, if you're going to do a brochure, I tell people try to, you know, if you're going to do, you can go to a six by nine because I can take that out of a 25 by 38 sheet, which is a standard size from the mill. But don't do seven by 10 because seven by 10, I can't cut as many out and, and you're losing almost 40 or 50% of the paper. And where does that paper go? The landfill. And why did I become an environmental printer? Is that I saw middle school kids celebrating Earth Day in 1990. That's the 20th anniversary of Earth Day. I saw them. I was driving around. I was on on Long Island driving around. I stopped the car. I was really, really uh, enthusiastic to see these kids. And uh, I decided that uh, I I wanted to become an environmental printer and I wanted to promote their mission of uh, being sustainable and having a better earth. Um, So an environmental printer, again, um, uses the right inks, the right toners. Uh, I I push 100% post-consumer waste paper, which by the way is 100% process chlorine free because the paper is bleached with oxygen or hydrogen peroxide, not chlorine. And if you bleach paper with chlorine, which is almost every other paper under 100% post-consumer waste is bleached with chlorine, chlorine mixed with other chemicals can create dioxin. Dioxin can poison us all. So um, that's a long-winded uh, about environmental printing, but there it is. No, I really appreciate that because I, you know a couple of things that you pointed out in there um, again, even having been involved in the, the print manufacturing space for as many years as I have, you know, that's why I really appreciate your perspective because, you know, the number out, right, and the size of the final product, that being, a, you know, a pretty big consideration in terms of being able to, to maximize yield. And, you know, oftentimes, uh, especially in this industry, you can see people that want to go with some more 
uh, let's call them designer sizes, if you will, for a specific reason, one or another. Um, but it's a great point to be mindful of that, you know, it does have an impact to the environmental standpoint. It obviously has an impact to the, to the cost of the product as well. I think everybody's kind of used to seeing that, seeing it from that standpoint, but to bring in the environmental factor of it. And then I also like what you said there in terms of, um, you know, that recycled content in the, the process uh, that is used to make the paper white and the fact that doing it one way versus the other uh, can be a completely additional, you know, environmental factor. I think that's super interesting that not a lot of people, um, one, would know about and two, give much thought. You know, we kind of talked about it before uh, we really jumped into this, but it's interesting to note that there are a lot of printers, uh, print manufacturers out there available that will um, purchase recycled material. Uh, but not necessarily give all of these additional factors and considerations to really round out the fact that you are being an eco-friendly printer. So again, I really appreciate the, the detailed definition there. Um, by, by the way, I'm just going to jump in. When you yeah. talk about cost and, and, and picking the right sizes, I'll just give, you, give one is I do a lot of greeting cards. And, and in greeting cards, I say to people, use a flat size nine by six and a quarter not 10 by seven. Because you go to Hallmark and it's usually 10 by seven, scored in half to five by seven. Yep. But if, what I run on a 13, 19 digital press, because a lot of times these orders are small and I can get double the amount of nine by six and a quarter size out of a 13, 19 than I can at 10 by seven. And there, and it, what it really ends up being is you say 50% because yep. I, can, I can double up what I can give you. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic uh, uh, example. And again, just kind of the, the thought and appreciation that goes into it uh, for a couple of different reasons. So I really appreciate that. Greg, why, why did you really want to be an entrepreneur, uh, you know, versus work for somebody else? Did you ever have a time in your life that you did that I, before you founded this? I, I think that... Uh... I remember when I was, a, I was a paper salesman, not an entrepreneur at that point. I started as a paper salesman. Um, and one day I walked into a print shop, one of the clients that I sold paper to. And uh, I said, you know, uh, I think I can sell some printing for you. And, and so they, this, this president of this company says to me, he says, well, if you sell any printing for me, I'll give you 10%. I said, I can do that. So the next week, I come in with an order for a $10,000 order of printing. And I said, well, you owe me a thousand bucks. He said, okay. I said, you know what? I think I can make more money selling printing than I can sell on paper. And so, um, you know, and it's more fun because there's, paper was getting too, you know, mundane. Everything was kind of the simple, same thing. Printing, there's so many different wild things that go on that uh, I had more, uh, more fun selling printing. And I also felt that um, I'm a gambler. And if you wanna be an entrepreneur, believe me, we're all gamblers. And, and you know, we might be giving away our 401c, uh, you know, with the, you know the, all the 401, what is that, 401k? 401k, yeah. We, you know, we lose all of those benefits that we need when you get to my age. And, and, and what happens is, but I, I enjoyed the challenge. You know, I used to wrestle in high school and college. And to me, it was like, you know, it's like I'm, I'm on the mats trying to fight and trying to, you know, do well in the business. So I, it's the excitement is pretty yeah. is why I did it. I love that. I mean, yeah. And I, you know, I kind of resonate with that uh, in a few different ways. I mean, my parents uh, own their own businesses as I was growing up. Uh, they actually own two different printing companies as I was growing up. And uh, they still own, you know, multiple businesses today. Um, none of their businesses today happen to be printing companies. Uh, but yeah, I, I totally get that. And now having my own business and kind of, you know, trying to grow that it's to your point, it's that challenge. It's the thing that keeps you, you know, up every night and getting up every morning and, you know, a, a bit of the uncertainty, but the ability to kind of pave your own path. And, um, yeah, I find what you give up maybe on some of the security part that you brought up. Uh, there's other opportunities. There are other, there are other doors that open 
um, because you're willing to do some of that really hard work. And uh, every day may not be certain, but <laughs> you know you can you can I, I make said, it I what said, you want. I set a goal every day as to what what I need to for my business. And um, so every day is a challenge, you know. And if you get you get past that goal, great. All right, you know. So um, I, I'm I'm really happy. I, be, I I did this. I'm really really happy. I became an environmental printer because a lot of my friends in this in this day and age are hurting. Print, printers are hurting, and uh, uh, with the backups of paper and 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 you know digital and and constant contact and all that stuff. But uh, I, as an environmental printer, my audience, a lot of people, they're willing to, uh, and by, by the way, my prices are competitive with non-environmental printing. I got to get that over with. But even if my prices were 5% higher, um, a lot of my clients want to do the right thing. They want to reach, you know, net zero waste by 2050, uh, you know, which yeah. is the Paris Accord. So um, I'm glad I'm, I, I went into this segment of the printing business. Yeah. And I, you know, to be honest with you, I feel like that kind of, you know, gives maybe paves the way for some other people, right? Like what I say is there will always be another printer around the block, right? That so many business, there are really aren't any new businesses. Okay. So my point is just exactly what you said, the ability for you to differentiate the ability for you to now kind of, you know, focus in and have that target market. And there are a lot of people that, um, sustainability is, you know, has been important, but will continue to be more important. And, um, you know, some of these companies have those kind of initiatives where they do want to get to a, a certain level of, um, you know, of, of net emissions. And so, you know, now you've kind of, not that it's new for you, but now you've opened up that opportunity where maybe some other people just become just one more person that does the exact same thing. And, that's what everybody's looking for, no matter if you're a printer or, you know, any type of, uh, you know, construction, skilled trades person, uh, anything, right? There's so many people that do the same thing, so many companies and businesses that do the exact same thing. How are you going to set yourself apart and kind of, you know, what's important to you, right? Like you became an eco-friendly printer because, you know, partially that was important to you. And so now, you know, it's easy for you to kind of speak out about it and attract more people into that conversation because, again, that was something that, you know, was important to you along the way. So, you want to hear a few of the reasons I became the yeah, environment? Uh, yeah, I'd love to. Um, at the 20th anniversary birthday, 1990, um, I was watching TV the day, the night before, and I saw Connie Chung on TV state that 60% of landfill problems are due to paper and printing waste, which is my industry. The next day, I, I had just mentioned that I saw middle school kids celebrating Earth Day. That really resonated with me. The next day, I saw on TV, they had a picture of a plane going into Newark Airport and telling, telling me that they closed the Fresh Kills landfill in Staten Island because it was 10 stories high in garbage. And they were afraid the plane would hit the landfill in descending to the airport. And then finally, um, I'm seeing on TV barges of filled with our garbage from New York City headed to different cities. And I go, that's not fair. That's not fair to the other cities. We're taking our New York City garbage and sending it somewhere. So those four or five items combined is, is what got me going. Yeah, it's a it's a great story and a great start to what you've uh, you know what you've built so far. And again, it's right. It's looking for opportunities, opportunities to differentiate, opportunities to solve a particular problem or something that could become a a, a much larger problem. Um, is what you know some of the most successful businesses have been born out of. So I appreciate you going into that detail. It's that's really really cool. So Greg, we talked a little bit about, you know, why become an entrepreneur. So I'm curious to get your takeaway on this, but you know, what, what are some of the things that keep you up at night with your business? You know, you mentioned uh, printers and, and again, I, I, I'm close to several of them still. And, uh, you know, between the supply chain issues and, you know, some labor issues and kind of the normal things of business, uh, you know, coming out of this pandemic. Uh, the things that people are having to deal with, but you know, for you specifically, what 
you know, what, what are some of those challenges? What are some of those things you know, that end up um, keeping you up at night? The same question six months ago, I'd have a different answer. But right now, the number one thing for me is paper supply. Now, you're, now my largest account, I print 700,000 greeting cards for my largest account, all right? And if, if one day I didn't have the paper on, on my floor, I might lose that client. And then I go, well, how much paper should I buy to, make, to, to cover myself for now and three months, four months, five months down the line? Because my number one paper, 100% recycled paper, post-consumer, is uh, a three-month backup. I used to be able to get the paper in one to two weeks, max. Now I'm talking three months. I'm, I'm involved with environmental packaging, which is a whole new field for, for us. You know, mailers, 100% recycled mailers, um, boxes, that type of thing. I'm finding out my mailers are five months backed up. Now, how do you, how do you, and, and, and a printer, how, what do we do? I mean, you're talking about cash flow to buy five, three or four times the amount of paper you need. Yeah. The, the uh, so that's, that's, that's one of the things. Um, how to tell a client how to send me the files correctly. <laughs> a favorite of all of my printer friends. Everybody that's in this space is going to love, love that you just what, said what, that. What is a PDF? What is a high risk <laughs> PDF? And, and I love that. I mean, bleed and crop marks. I want an eighth inch bleed on all four sides and I want crop marks. Uh, so, you know, so that that's, you know, doing that. I do have designers on staff. And what happens is, let's say you give me an order and uh, you need, uh, let's say you need a letterhead or a flyer and, it's, and you're bleeding on all, on all four sides. I send it over to my designer and I tell them, just deal with the client until it's okayed. Then send me back the link with the links, with the, uh, you know, crop marks and whatever bleed. And then I go. So uh, how to tell a client without, you know, upsetting the client, you know, I don't want them to think that they don't know what they're doing. Um, and I, I think, you know, what's up tonight is how do we keep the business going in this climate yeah. of COVID? Um, yeah. I will say this February, March of last year, when COVID hit, I was down 80% in my business. You want to talk about not being able to sleep too good when you when your business is, is, it looks like it's going down. It's, it's scary times. Um, so that would be, let's say, February, March, April, the greeting card company I keep referring to says, I want uh, 70,000 greeting cards. And I look at him, I said, uh, are you smoking something? You never bought, bought 70,000 greeting cards. 20,000 would be a big order. Yeah. And, and he goes to me, he says, you know what? Since we're hunkering down, which is the new word, um, and pe we're not going to see people, and I sell my greeting cards through Amazon, What's happening is my orders have gone up four times because people are, are buying the greeting cards, sending it to clients, family, whatever. Um, so that that replaced all my business, you know, business cards. I don't make a fortune on business, but nobody does. But at least six of my major accounts never gave me a business card for a year. So I had to replace the business that was lost when sales people couldn't go out to trade trade centers trade shows to give out cards so i got lucky in that i switched gears and i and i promoted more of the greeting cards i i went into environmental packaging which was a brand new field for me um and uh i've also created something brand new i am making a double thick setup box so let's say you let's say i have clients that do candles so let's say you have a, a very light light item going into a small box uh, and, the, and you only need um, 500 boxes. Well, you can't print 500 boxes economically on a 24 point, 24 thousandths of an inch thick paper. But what you can do is you, I can print 500 sheets on a 100 pound cover, which is about 12 point, mounted to another 100 pound cover. Now I'm up to 24, 25 point. So I, I, I can do the minimum run digitally. I can mount them and then die cut them and, and put them out to market. So um, I have that on my website in, in packaging and boxes um, where I even have eco-friendly printer lists just as a sample of what it looks like. Uh, 
And, and also I do a lot of four color boxes in small quantities. Very cool. Yeah, very cool. I mean, you know, to speak to kind of some of the things that you brought up in terms of, you know, keeping you up at night, believe me, you, you are not alone with any of that. And it's a lot of conversations that I have. The, the real challenge that I see on the supply chain side of things is that you're just really limited on options, right? Uh, to your point, you can purchase in advance, which is going to impact your cash flow. And the scary part about that is just the fact that because we're in a climate that you don't necessarily know what's going to happen tomorrow, uh, or especially in six months from now, you know, potentially you're bringing that, that material in-house and inventorying it. You've got all those additional expenses as well, but you could be bringing that in for a client that might not be around uh, in, you know, six months or 12 months. So, you know, it's, it's a challenge from that side. Um, it's a challenge on the supplier side. I, I talked to some of the uh, you know, whether it be uh, manufacturer or merchant side of things on the on the paperboard side, but you, know, you talk to them and, and they're just as, you know, just as sideways because they're dealing with it on both sides, you know, from your standpoint and from, you know, if we're talking about a distributor, but, you know, the, the manufacturing side, and it's becoming a real challenge for them to try to make new deals and try to, you know, secure paper because as fast as it's getting secured or as fast as it's coming in, it's going back out. So um, that one's definitely not an easy one to, uh, to solve in a short period of time uh, by any stretch. And, and you're, uh, like I said, by far not alone. Um, my, my, my advice to a lot of my fellow uh, printers or other clients I have an I have an order that's that's a rerun from last year. They want to buy 750 books. They want it's 200 pages plus cover. It's a beautiful job for me. I'm telling the client that they I want to buy the paper today. I don't need to deliver the job until Christmas, but yeah. I need I need to buy the paper now. So <clears throat> I said, if you want to get this job, you're going to give me a deposit for the paper because I'm going to buy it today. Because because yeah. two weeks from now it's too late. Yeah. No, it's it's a hundred percent accurate. I mean, you know, again, from the client side, people are not necessarily understanding, um, you know, how impacted this industry is uh, when you start talking about paper, and it really is that uh, that dire of a situation where if you're not committing and purchasing, uh, in some cases, you could wait a day and lose that paper. You could wait a few hours on a decision and and ultimately lose that order because it's gone to a, a to another printer who had the cash and was ready to move on it. So yeah, that's, that's wise words on there. Um, you brought up about the files. I, 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 you know, coming from that industry, I appreciate that uh, by any stretch. Some of the stuff we used to do, we would do uh, and, and I would say it's a little bit more readily available now, but you can do some nice video walkthroughs, some video tutorials for people, because, you know, I, I know you already know this, but you can create as many PDF checklists as you'd like and make them available on your website. And, you know, not too many people end up looking at those. So I like the video walkthrough as kind of a high level step-by-step, -step, uh, to show people. And you could also do, uh, depending on, you know, how advanced your clients are. Uh, but what I like is, you know, for some of those marketing teams, our work departments, designers, whoever's doing it, almost create like a small video, you know, library series for them and get their people kind of early in so that you can help educate them. Uh, you know, and at the end of the day, we're printers. So we'll always have to deal with the stuff that gets sent in no matter what. So that's how I used to always tell my, I, I, my I, crew. I, it's, nice to, it's nice to have a designer that I say, could you do me a favor? Can you call David or somebody and, and just walk them through what, what, what needs to be done? And, and the reason I turn that over to the designer because the designer knows a hundred times more about design than I do and uh, can explain it in, in such a way is that uh, I, get, I get my files faster. Uh, but I do like your idea of maybe having my designer create a small video not a bad idea, you know, it's a yeah, great it doesn't, idea. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it doesn't have to be ultra complex, right? I'm talking about like a, a five minute or less video. And to me, you could break that up, you know, the kind of whole entire design process into maybe three five minute videos uh, to really walk somebody through at, at you know, 
at a high level, you're giving examples, you're talking about why are we, you know, why, why are we setting the, you know, the, the overprint black to these, uh, you know, particular densities versus, you know, something else, right? It's, it's little tips like that, where to your point, your designer has picked this stuff up over the course of time and learning what works well and what doesn't work well and, you know, tips and tricks. And I find that, um, you know, when you can just share that knowledge, especially make those resources available to your clients. Um, yeah, I've, I've found in the past that that really helps kind of move the needle and it's a lot more interactive. Um, I'll give you one other thing that would really be uh, beneficial. I've, I've not used it in the print environment. I've used it in some other environments, but uh, there's a tool out there and there's a bunch of them. So I'm not, I, I get no, you know, promotional, uh, uh, promotional revenue out of this, but there's a tool called Loom, L-O-O-M. And basically what it is, it's a screen recorder that will also put a video of, of yourself. So you can use an integrated webcam, you can, you know, do offline equipment, what have you. But basically what it'll do is it'll put your face in the corner of your screen and allow you to do tutorials. And so that way they're getting the video kind of one-on-one -on -one interaction, but then you're also able to do a screen share and walk people through kind of step-by-step. -step. And that's a really cool um, tool to be able to implement into a, a video tutorial like this. Uh, and then you can send it out to your clients. You can put it available on your website. You can, you know, do all kinds of different stuff with it to get it uh, out there. But uh, you know, that's, that's something I'm going to do. That's yeah. A great yeah it's, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. So yeah, it's pretty, it's a, uh, it's a pretty slick tool. So I think you'll, I think you'll get some good uh, use out of that. So kind of shifting uh, gears, Greg, I, you know, I, I'd love if you could, my question is kind of, you know, what do you do in your downtime, right? When you're not worried about your business, but I know you do a lot of work around mental health advocacy and, you know, uh, Neil's wheels. And I'd love if you could, to me, it's just, it's such an important topic and I know we're kind of shifting gears, but I'd love if you could talk a little bit about that and the work that you do to support that and, and a little bit about your story and your son's story. Um, because I'd love to be able to, to get that message out there to more people. It's, it's something so many people struggle with. It's something that we don't talk about nearly enough. And so I feel like having more voices around it and just, you know, continuing to bring uh, awareness and support and all those things is just super important. Yeah, my, my son, Neil, was a, a, almost like an All-American all lacrosse player. He was just maybe the best athlete in Manhattan High School. And, uh, you know, I had, I remember in his sophomore year, uh, Notre Dame came to me at, after a playoff game and said, we want Neil to go to Notre Dame, you know, for their scholarship type of thing. Um, the problem is, is that uh, in his junior and senior year, he, he started to regress a little bit and, no, and we couldn't figure it out. Um, and uh, um, it was late, you know, and then he eventually was diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia. And um, that kind of, that obviously ended his career of lacrosse and ended his career for a lot of things. Um, the lacrosse coach and I uh, set up a foundation to raise food for hungry and, and homeless families. Um, and, and it's called NeilsWheelsNY.com. And uh, so far, we've raised uh, over 100,000 cans of food. And um, it also gave me the opportunity to go into Manhasset, Washington, St. Mary's, different schools to talk about mental health. And the subject is, um, what would you do if it happened to you? Or what would you do if it happened to your best friend? You're, I'm, I'm talking now to middle school kids. What would you do? Would you keep it a secret? Uh, because you don't want to rat out your friend or would you go to the teacher to the parent this and that so um that message got across and um a lot of people would reach out to me um nami which is national alliance on mental illness they actually had me as as a person to speak to if a family is going through what i went through um and i'm happy to talk about it so um instead of you know, when they call and I said, instead of feeling sorry for myself or my son feeling sorry for his self, we did, we did, we created Neil's Wheels. And, um, and then the best thing I did with Neil's Wheels is that I created a Facebook page so that Neil, uh, so that Neil could communicate with his friends. 
you know, because if, if his friend came to see him in the hospital, you wouldn't want to give out his phone number because he might call at three in the morning. He might call you 10 times a day. But if I were the Facebook page, he was able to go back and forth with his friends. Of course, I became his secretary because I, you know, I would say, hey, Neil, <laughs> what, do you, what, do you wanna, what do you wanna say to your friend? And, uh, um, but the, the real key thing is to destigmatize the, the word mental illness because there are so many people that are afraid to talk about it. Uh, family members are embarrassed that they're their their brother their sister their mother their father have been alone and i i had to come out and say look this is like if you had a you had cancer or if you had some other illness and this and that you would always talk about it but why do we have to not talk about mental health and now because of what's going on with all the schools around the country you got to talk about it i mean you got you got kids that are made high anxiety maybe if you were if 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 somebody was able to reach a young young person before they get they before they you know get you know shoot shoot people up or whatever i mean you know it's it, you have to open up so i yeah. i spend a lot of time doing that i still do it um i work with long island cares if you ever heard of that the cat you know carry shape and the cats in the griddle um that's where 80 percent of the food that i raise go and the reason that i, I raise so much food is that the kids that the coach, the, the coach, the lacrosse coach also taught, you know, in Manhasset, the kids came to, to the coach and said, I, they wanted to give cakes and cookies to Neil. And the hospital wouldn't take it because a lot of people have sugar, you know, diabetes, or whatever. And so I, we went and said, uh, can we, can we give the food to, you know, somewhere else? And, and is it okay if we go to homeless shelters? And, and so, they, everybody said yes, and so uh, so we started donating food to the homeless shelters, and then the coach went back to the the kids and said, you know what, um, pe you know people that are hungry are not hungry just you know at holiday they're hungry all year round. So he and I kept this thing going for 13 weeks, the first for, you know like January through April the first year, and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and we had corporations giving me food. Um, so um, I really, ex I really expanded that quite a bit. And uh, Neil, I represented Neil at his tenth reunion from high school, and uh, obviously he couldn't go. And um, and I said, Neil, what do you want to say to your classmates? And he said two things. One is don't feel sorry, sorry for me because I'm okay. And the second is you haven't reached your the goal that you have set forth in life. Don't worry, you still have time. And I can never forget that one. Is here is a mental ill child telling his classmates how to run their lives so um you know it, it's uh, it's fascinating but uh yeah uh that is when you'd say what do i do for like uh, my extra time away from printing uh mental health is right up there um i like to walk run uh play golf uh go swimming and um one of one of the things i i have a blog you know, which is on my site, you know, ecofriendlyprinter.com forward slash blog. On there, I, I said, take, I have one of my blogs that I wrote, it says, take care of yourself. And it's all about, you know, a, you know, you know, you got to take a break. You can't just keep working around the clock because I need you for the long haul. And that one blog has outperformed the other hundred blogs because people, people want to know that, you, you know, you got to take care of yourself too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I really appreciate you sharing all of that. It's, you know, as, as I mentioned, it's, it's something near and dear to me and, you know, the charitable work that I support uh, goes to support, uh, you know, mental health in, in, in youth uh, as one of their kind of core initiatives. And, you know, it's what you said, right. No matter if you're talking about a mental illness or, or just the kind of awareness around mental health and what's going on, especially today and how it's impacting people in general, but youth, especially uh, because, you know, we, we, we don't necessarily uh, spend enough time talking about it and bringing awareness to that, but, but kind of, you know, hopefully between the work that you're doing and the work that we're all doing to continue to bring awareness and to continue to talk about it, it does remove you know, those stigmas in, in that you can have some healthier dialogues about it and ultimately get to the point where, 
you know, you're making a real impact. And yeah, what, uh, you know, what your son said in terms of uh, his kind of two, two lessons and the ability to share that, I'm sure, number one, I'm sure it kind of really struck you, you know, being a dad. Uh, but number two, just what I mean, like, what an incredible message to share with people, because it's really, it's really at the heart of life, right? Uh, it really is. And so to, to be able to share that, um, was probably really, really special. So I appreciate you, you know, sharing that with us here and uh, definitely, definitely a moment of impact for me uh, out of this episode. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. So Greg, as we kind of wind down and wrap up, I'd like to just really ask you one final question and that's, you know, what's a piece of advice that you've picked up along the way that you feel compelled to share with people kind of that what's that best piece of advice that you've been given, whether it relates to, you know, your business or kind of life in general, uh, do you have something that you can share? Uh, you know, when I, uh, used to wrestle in high school and college, uh, my coach would say to me, never give up no matter how bad things are going, you could be down 10 to one and you could still turn around and pin the guy. Um, I would I would say is that never give up in business. I mean, there there's some day, days where, like you said, I, I I can't sleep at night because I'm worried about, you know, I'm losing money on this job or this I can't get paper or whatever. But uh, the key is just just keep moving forward. Um, and if you have any problems, call Greg Barber. <laughs> <laughs> I really like that. I really like that. But yeah, it's, it is great advice, you know, especially as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, you can very easily get down in yourself and continue to work, worry about all of the unknowns that go along with that. And, um, you know, you live to fight another day, some days and in other days, you're super energized when you get up because of the things that you've going to, got going on. But I really like that. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. And I want to thank you, Greg, for coming on the show today. I've really appreciated this. Um, I know you mentioned it before, and I will also put it in the show notes, but tell us again where the best place is for people to find you. Well, the best way is to go to my website, which is ecofriendlyprinter.com, E-C-O-F-R-I-E-N-D-L-Y-P-R-I-N-T-E-R.com. My phone number is 973 Two two four one one three two. My email is greg at ecofriendlyprinter.com. So if you go to ecofriendly, if you go greg at ecofriendlyprinter.com, you're doing an email. If you want to text me or call me, it, it, you know, it goes off the 973 number. I, a lot of people like texting better than emails, and I, I do both. And uh, I am a bit of a, a workaholic. So, uh, I see emails and text messages seven days a week. Well, I might put you to the test on that. <laughs> Thanks. Do it with an order, though. <laughs> Thanks for sharing all that, Craig. And like I said, I will make sure to put that in the show notes. Thank you again for coming on the show today. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening today. If we brought you any value, please rate, subscribe, and share our podcast. Also, be sure to connect with us on social media by searching at the Chrysler Club. Until next week, I'm your host, Dave Chrysler.